And with that, I'm going to begin to pivot on over to Beth to introduce our long program to keep us on time. Beth, over to you. Thanks, President Jeff. I appreciate it. Hi, everyone. I'm Beth Knox, and I am really excited about our panel today. So I'm going to start us off with uh, just a quick introduction of each of our three panelists and uh, give you a little bit of background on them. So we're going to start with Jackie Brassington. She's the COO and General Manager of Evergreen Herbal. And as the General Manager uh, of Evergreen Herbal in Seattle, she manages a team of over 35 professionals in the manufacture quality branded cannabis infused products. Her company has been recognized by Puget Sound Business Journal as a top 100 fastest growing private companies in Washington State for both 2017 and 2018. She brings significant business experience having previously founded and led an international wine bottle and packaging supplier. She was also uh, invited to join Governor Locke's trade mission trip to China back in 2010. In her current role, she's been recognized as one of the top 75 women business executives in cannabis. Our second panelist is uh, Jessica Tanani, CEO of Verda Bio. Uh, she has over two decades of experience in life science where, when she co-founded the marijuana research company that she now leads. She's been active in obtaining cannabis research legislation and has worked in the three pieces of legislation that enabled the research of cannabinoids in Washington State. She's been named one of the most interesting people in cannabis by the Seattle Times. And additionally, she's been widely quoted as an expert in publications such as Nature, Science, Popular Science, Bloomberg, High Times, Genome Technologies, and Entrepreneur. She was a Howard Hughes Fellow with an MS in Immunology and a BS in Microbiology. And then last but certainly not least, Shannon Veto, CEO of Evergreen Market. She started her career as an audit tax CPA with PricewaterhouseCoopers and then spent 19 years at Russell Investments, building their financial footprint around the world. She was responsible for the global operations that doubled gross revenue and tripled net profit in six years, expanded their presence across four continents, and ultimately contributed to selling the private firm to the London Stock Exchange uh, for $2.7 billion in the late 2014. She left to start her own business in 2016, which is partnered exclusively on the global vertical within the legal cannabis industry. Since last December, she has served as CEO of Evergreen Market, a privately held cannabis company which generates over 30 million in annualized gross revenue. So I really wanted to share uh, all of those, that background, uh, so that you'd have a, a real appreciation for the expertise uh, that these three women bring to this conversation. So let's get started with setting the stage and start with some fundamentals. Now in December of 2012, Washington became the first US state to legalize recreational use of cannabis or marijuana, and second in recreational sales, which happened two years later in 2014. Under state law, cannabis is legal for medical purposes and also for any purpose by adults over 21. So Jessica, let's start with you. Can you help us understand the definitions or differences between cannabis and hemp, CBD and THC and any other facts that will help orient us throughout the program? You bet. Uh, I get asked this a lot. Um, so it's important to think that the term cannabis actually encompasses both hemp and marijuana. It's the name of the genus of the plant. So you can think of it like roses. So there's pink roses and there's red roses, but they're both roses. So both marijuana and hemp are technically cannabis plants. The difference is though, rather than being differentiated by color, like the pink and the red and roses, they're differentiated by a THC. Um, and specifically whether or not the plant produces THC. And uh, I, my guess is people on the call know what THC is. Um, THC is a psychoactive molecule. Um, it's really what people think of when they think of marijuana. It has both medicinal and recreational attributes, which makes it kind of unique from a legislation or you, how you think of it perspective. Um, so stepping back, if a plant produces more than 0.3% THC, it is marijuana. If it produces less than 0.3, it is hemp. 
Um, the plant produces THC because um, it wants to be protected from pathogens. THC protects the plant from being infected with pathogens. So the plant really doesn't care whether it's making THC or not. Um, one common fallacy is you can look at a plant and you can determine whether it's hemp or marijuana. That's not true. It would be similar to trying to differentiate us on the call by cholesterol levels. You know, saying everybody with a cholesterol level of 180 is illegal, below 180 is not illegal. Um, and so if a plant produces THC, it's marijuana, no THC or less than 0.3, it's hemp. Um, both marijuana and hemp can produce CBD. CBD has become a very popular molecule. Uh, people like it for things like inflammation, insomnia, um, anxiety, different attributes. And you really will only know whether or not you're getting your CBD from marijuana or hemp based on where you buy it. So if you buy it in your local, local grocery store or online or different sources, it's most likely from hemp. If you go to Shannon's store and you buy it from um, a marijuana outlet, than it is from marijuana. Um, and so that's kind of the overview um, in a nutshell of the difference between cannabis and hemp and the difference, or sorry, marijuana and hemp and the difference between THC and CBD. All right, thank you. That helps kind of uh, set the stage here. So now I'm gonna uh, turn to Jackie. Jackie, research has traditionally been done by the government without support from independent scientists. Uh, can you share with us how research has changed and what are some of the takeaways that you've seen? And Jessica, you may want to uh, interject some things as well. Yeah, I actually think that might be a better question for Jessica. Um, <laughs> but in, in, my, in my world, there isn't really any research. There's only, Jessica is the only licensed cannabis researcher in the nation, if I'm correct on that. Um, and the only other people that can research cannabis as a, as a university, is that right, Jess? Mississippi. So University of Mississippi. And, uh, you know, kind of setting the stage when legalization on a recreational perspective happened in the state of Washington, um, I just sold a biotech and decided, hey, you know, cannabis research seems interesting. There's a lot of molecules, there's enough medical utility there, and there's not a lot of research. So let's form an egg bio company. Um, we went to the state and we said, we want to form an egg bio company. Uh, we want a marijuana license. And they said, that sounds awesome, but it's against the law. You are allowed to grow marijuana and sell it or destroy it. If you don't sell or destroy it, you are breaking the law. If you decide to research it, we cannot license you. Uh, you have to change the law. Um, I'm a science major. I didn't know the difference between the House and the Senate. It took us... Uh, Three years we got legislation changed and we got the first research license but um, it's important to note that you know Washington allowed people to buy marijuana to use from a recreational perspective years before they allowed us to just simply grow it in our research facility. Wow okay that's pretty significant that, that our state is really leading uh, the edge on that research so thank you for that. Uh, okay, so now let's shift over and try to give us a, a little bit of a, a, a visual of what, what it looks like to be in a cannabis retail location. So Shannon, I am going to turn it to you. I know we, you brought some photos that Mariah is going to put up on the screen. And Shannon, maybe you can just walk us through the, the pictures and uh, give us a little bit of insight of what to experience when we go into a store. Yeah, well, I'll first start with every store is a little bit different. Um, and I'll tell you that at least the way that our stores were put together were to be more welcoming and look a little more mainstream, if you will. They were built to look like a rustic market um, and also comply with all of the um, levels of compliance. So that's actually the, the molecule for, um, for THC but the, um, on our floors, but the, some, I don't know if you can go back to the pictures. This is, um, you're going so fast, I can't really talk to them, maybe. <laughs> um, so the first picture is one where, this is actually our Bellevue store. We have five stores, one in Bellevue, one in Kirkland, two in Renton, and one in Auburn. Our state only allows, um, under legislation, five stores in the state of Washington. We also have some licenses in California 
California law is very different, but we try to set it up so that you actually can come in. Many people come in and they, they actually don't, they've never been in a store before. Um, we're set up to really educate and, and walk people through what is a bunch of different ways in which you can buy marijuana. I'm in my 50s, so um, back in my high school experiences, you know, there was only really one form and it was a flower form and it, it was smoked. Um, you can buy it in a lot of different form factors now from, you can drink it in a, a beverage, you can have a gummy, you can have a tincture, um, which is like an eyedropper, um, to actually there's sriracha that has THC in it. So there's a lot of new product innovation comes out of ways you, in which you can consume it. It all has um, a fairly similar effect if it has THC in it, as well as CBD, you just have to look at how much is in there. Um, one of the real important points in, um, is that you have to really understand what you're buying and that's really important to us. So we have a lot of shopping space. Some, some stores do, some stores don't. And also you should know, you know, there's a lot of safety mechanisms we have to put in place so it doesn't feel like um, you are walking into a really controlled dark room with a lot of drugs in it. I mean, that's really kind of the aspect where in 2014, which is when the first stores opened in our state, we really wanted to create more of a welcoming environment. Um, the other thing to know is you don't, you can't buy anything in a marijuana store legally. We can't sell it unless it's marijuana. Um, there are some easing that will allow us to sell hemp-based CBD, but generally speaking, um, we don't sell t-shirts, we don't sell um, any food other than food that has marijuana in it because it is actually, we're not allowed to. So um, the only reason you'll actually ever go to a store is because technically you wanna buy something or at least learn about it. Um, I would say pretty much most of my peers and most of my, um, the individuals I've met within this industry, are pretty welcoming and the stores are set up to, um, talk to people who've never been in. You don't even have, you don't get these high pressure sales either. It's really, um, you know, from my vantage point, I, I worked in the finance industry for, for 30 years. Um, I held five federal licenses. I never even spent a day in, the, in a cannabis store, let alone a lot of the grows and the facilities that are doing the extractions and producing and processing until about five years ago. And it's, surprisingly um, more front forward than you think that's standardized retail with all of the degrees of legislation and, and regulation um, overlaying on top of us, which adds a lot of um, extra steps. But I think you would find it to be a pretty welcoming experience. If you've never been to one, I invite any of you to come to any one of my stores. I invite you to give me a call directly. I'd give you a personal tour. Um, it's a really amazing industry to join and there's some pretty powerful innovation here and some pretty um, neat people who think really outside the box and, and differently. And I think we'll see, uh, I'll go there, Jessica and Jackie, but I, I think we'll see federal legalization in the next five years. You know, right. Shannon, it's kind of funny because I have a 94 year old, very conservative grandpa who decided that he wanted to try some marijuana for foot pain. So I told him that a store was analogous to the old liquor stores. And he uh, called me up afterwards and he said, Jess, they're actually nicer than the old liquor stores. So, you know, I think it, it's very analogous to having your ID checked, having a very regulated store, buying what, what and leaving. So um, my guess is people on the call have been to liquor stores back when they were regulated here in the state. And it's very similar. And if you do go to a store and you don't want your ID scanned, you can tell them you don't and yeah. they will not scan it. I know that that's been a issue where I've, I get that question a lot, especially from my parents or their friends um, who are very interested in the CBD cream that has been very effective for them, but I don't want my ID scanned. Don't want my kids to know or something like that. You don't have to have it scanned. We kind of like to touch on um, taking the cloak of secrecy or uh, being an illegal, kind of taking the mystery out of going into a cannabis store. Um, I'm a manufacturer, and if anybody ever wants to come down, I have 40,000 square feet in Soto. Um, we make a lot of different products from high CBD to very, very high THC. 
But I think with our generation, um, I'm figuring I'm kind of somewhere in, in, in everyone's generation or there, thereabouts, there's a lot of mystery around using cannabis. And we all have this taboo, you know, had this taboo feeling around um, imbibing in cannabis and what it could do for us. But I'd like to start the education process for everyone that I meet to remove the mystery and remove the um, the taboo that is around cannabis. The cannabis plant is such a helpful, healing, wonderful thing that has so many things to offer from, you know, we, there's definitely the recreation side. Everyone knows about getting high from, from cannabis. But if you go from cannabis to the CBD or any of the other cannabinoids that exist in the cannabis plant, the healing properties are unbelievable. And I mean, truly unbelievable. And I believe, and I just could probably back me up on this, that there, especially in, in, as we age and get older and we get more and more prescriptions on our nightstand, um, that cannabis can, you can learn how to use cannabis to relieve a lot of those things, to get off of opioids and to get off of, of um, pain relievers and anti-inflammatories and things that you never have to feel the psychoactive uh, uh, effect of cannabis, but you will also, but you will feel the medicinal qualities of, of cannabis. I'm not a doctor, um, but I know that there has been research that backs all of this up. And the plant has been around for, you know, how many millions of years and uh, being used as a medicinal quality for many of those. So I I'd love to, you know, be able to answer any questions. Again, I'm not a doctor. Jess could probably answer more of the scientific things. Um, mm -hmm. But I, my goal in life is to educate people on the, the medicinal properties of cannabis and to remove the taboo feelings and all of the, you know, the nefarious things that go around cannabis because we all need to be using it. And I think it's our future. And I think once we educate people and let them know um, what it can do, I see that in the next five years, most of my generation and probably even more um, will be microdosing themselves with CBD with zero side effects, but a lot less inflammation, a lot le pa less pain, a lot more movement. Um, we're seeing a big spike now in professional athletes uh, dosing with CBD and THC. Um, THC helps it a little bit for the uptake of the, of the uh, cannabinoid. But there's so much out there, and my goal is to remove the mystery and um, make everybody understand what it can do for us. So that's my pitch. That, that's, that's really helpful. And Jackie, while we have you on the screen, uh, you know, there's so many myths around uh, this, this topic. Uh, and you, you mentioned you have 40,000 square feet in your manufacturing center. Can you describe uh, the, the regulations uh, in, that are involved with manufacturing this product and, and maybe dispel some of those myths? Sure. Uh, I mean, I, I could talk on this for a long time, but to start with, I'm a food manufacturer. I make candy and I make beverages. Um, I happen to have one ingredient that is a regulated ingredient. So I'm a food manufacturer that happens to use cannabis as all it is is an ingredient. It's a highly regulated ingredient. It can't move. We track it from seed to sale. Um, and we have lots of regulations that go around um, following. Nothing. No, nothing moves around without identification on it. So um, where J Jess has everything uh, tagged and you go into Shannon's store, you can pick up any one of my products or any one of anybody else's product and you know where that came from. You can find out who the growers are. You can find out whether or not there were any pesticides used in the growing of that, how, how the cannabis was grown, whether it was indoor, outdoor, hoop or aeroponic. All of the information is there. So that makes me a little bit different type of manufacturer because I have to give much more information than others. But really, I'm a simple food manufacturer. Got it. Uh, and, and just a reminder to everyone, uh, please put your questions in the chat forum and all three of our speakers will be available. As you can see, they're very willing to answer any question you have. So Shannon, I'm gonna to turn to you. Another uh, kind of mysterious aspect has been the, the banking side of uh, this business. That's really your, your wheelhouse. Can you share a little bit about what's involved uh, from, from that perspective? Sure. Well, first of all, banking is available in our industry. I think a lot of people think, oh, you guys don't have any banks, do you? We, we do. 
their, uh, their small credit unions and state banks and some states don't have any. Um, but the reality is all we're getting is um, basic cash services. So you can write a check and you can deposit your cash. We're in our state, pretty much 100% cash business. There are aspects of credit. It's actually not credit. It's more of a debit facilities that you can use, but they're, they're pretty expensive. They're very complicated, but no credit cards. Credit cards are all federal. Um, some of the other things that people find interesting is um, most banks don't want you depositing your cash at their branches because especially if it comes from the grow, the cash smells um, and it can smell up a whole bank. So um, they like that to happen in some drop areas. Um, the cash counting exercise is pretty uh, big hassle. And, you know, if any of you follow any of the current federal legislation, there's a safe banking act that actually is um, independent of whether you think cannabis should be regulated, there's 33 states that actually have some form of legalization today and are, tra are, are uh, transacting. Um, and they're meant to create a safe harbor for banks to allow for banking, which would allow credit facilities, which would allow you know, more forms of financing. The cost of capital in our industry is three to one from within the U.S. versus outside the U.S. So cost of capital outside the U.S. is one-to-one -one in this industry. It's growing much faster outside the industry, yet the size of the market in the U.S. is massive. All of our, co all of our companies that are going public are going public in Canada. All the corporate tax dollars are um, going to Canada, not to the U.S. So um, despite what you think about, you know, cannabis yourself, it's as an, as an industry, it's a it's a matter of, of, of when, not if anymore. I just think there's tons of jobs. There's tax revenues that are funding our states. Um, the tax revenues are funding our federal government. And we should at least allow, you know, some form of, of normal banking services to these industries. And safe banking is just that safe harbor. And it's past the House and waiting on the Senate. And, and Shannon, one of the other things that people don't realize is that we actually paid a bank. So, you know, it's a lot of dollars a month or so per business, oftentimes to pay to bank and no interest on the money. Um, so, you know, it is profitable for some banks to be within the industry. Yeah, state of Washington has seven, currently seven banks and credit unions that bank our industry and probably the largest number in any, any other state. Nevada opened there was not a bank for the first two or three years. People had to truck their cash to California or up to Colorado and pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to do so on a regular basis. And some still do. Okay, well, and I'm looking at the chat form and the questions, no surprise, are plentiful. So Ken, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, I know that there is one in here from Virginia McKenzie that specifically I talked to Jessica about uh, so perhaps you can start with that one. All right. They are coming in fast and furious. So let's see if we can get through at least some of them. We've got about, I don't know, 15 minutes. So this will be good. Uh, Virginia's, is that the one you wanted? Okay. First time caller, this is your request line. Mm -hmm. I have heard that people who try... No, that's not funny. I've <laughs> heard that people who try edibles for the first time accidentally get too high. How do you educate people on how much... To eat? Uh, that is a really good question. And I think I'll start with the fact that it is very easy to feel like you are going to die or overdose of cannabis. It is very difficult to actually physically do that. So it's kind of the inverse of alcohol, where it's actually fairly easy to overdose on al alcohol. Uh, and you generally don't know that you've overdosed until it's too late on alcohol. Um, cannabis is kind of the inverse. Um, so for example, um, to overdose on cannabis, you would have to consume the equivalent of about 90 can candies per kilogram of body weight or 90 servings per kilogram of body weight. And you know, a kilogram is, is roughly two pounds, so you can kind of do the math. That being said, um, oftentimes with one, you know, a 1% or less of that, you will feel like you're going to die. 
Um, cannabis is very easy to have an adverse, like I've consumed too much. So two things. One is that I've consumed too much will pass. Um, the second thing is start slow. Uh, you know, the serving size in the state of Washington is 10 milligrams. I tell people if you haven't used it, start with two and a half milligrams, quarter it up, start slow, give it four to six hours. It takes a while to work its way through your body. And you can always, you know, have a night where you really don't have the recreational experience you think you're going to have. And, but it's not bad. It's just nothing. And then the next night, consume a little more. So, you know, work in slow, but know that it is very difficult to overdose. It is very easy to feel like you've overdosed. All never, right. never, never take two. Never, never. Uh, you know, that's the, people, that's the basic rule. <laughs> in, the, in, in most people, I would say a lot of people do a uh, serving size is too much for them for a, a pleasant recreational experience. Um, you know, so start with part of a serving size if you're new to the. All right. So, uh, uh, so blind to the ridiculous questions now. So this is the, the opposite end of the spectrum. What has happened to the black market since legalization? Still there. Still the same size. No. I mean, it's small. It's, you know. Well, first we call it the illicit market. And um, we, it's, it's much less active in our state than in other states, in particular in California. But um, it's definitely, it's definitely during COVID become way more active than it was before. It's, yeah. it's the dynamic of our taxation. So in our state, our taxation, you pay 37% excise tax on top of all the other federal um, taxes that we pay. So when you pay a dollar for a product in the front of my store, 87 cents for a highly scaled company goes to some taxing agency. In the illicit market, that's zero that goes to any, any taxation. Therefore, you can do the math and it becomes really a price game. And it's, it's one of those things that I think that going into the store, you know, uh, I, I would say the vast majority of people I know go into a store for convenience and quality and, you know, they know what they're getting, but the, the black market still, or the illicit market still has a very large presence in, you know, some of the, the market that was there before legalization occurred in the medical, and it's still really active due to the price differences. So, a I lot of now of, of, because of legalization at the state level, the ease of actually growing it and not getting in trouble or being called out because you can grow plants for medical purposes, small numbers, um, it means it's more available. So, and, speak, oh, I'm sorry, Jackie, go ahead. I was just going to say a little aside when it comes to the difference between the black market and, and we were talking about the taxes, just kind of throwing it out there, the marijuana industry in Washington state contributes $1.2 million a day, 365 days a year to the coffers of Washington state. So it's, it's a significant amount of money. Um, it goes into a general fund. So um, maybe that's one of the reasons we are deemed an essential business as well. So um, <laughs> it's, it's one of those things that we have a lot to offer in this business, um, in this industry. And uh, I hope that you know, our tax dollars get spent well because we, we pay 38% uh, cannabis tax. So speaking of growing, is it legal to grow it on your own property? Uh, so it depends on, with a medical license, there's some, um, for our, if, you're, if you're doing it from recreational and don't have a medical authorization, it is not necessarily unless you have a 502 recreational grow license. And there's a number of people that will live on the property that they have their business on. Um, but the flip side of that is that you can grow a small amount with a medical authorization. So it uh, depends on the medical authorization that you have, but in general, it's about six plants or so. Um, there's some authorizations that will allow more co-op situations, but small numbers of plants are legal with medical authorization in the state. I think the other thing to know is that when you do, um, the difference between the illicit market and the regulated market is the tests that are um, required are pretty material in terms of um, the manufacturing process so you know what you're getting um, and you know it's been tested if you buy it in if you buy it in a in the legal market yeah. okay 
Right, Jackie, this one's directed to you, apparently. What do you say to those who ask about the unjust amount of prison terms ex executed involving marijuana over the years, justifications used to discriminate the, eff the effort of marijuana on people? Well, I think anybody who's in prison right now for a marijuana uh, offense, especially a small one, I mean, if they're, if they're trafficking in marijuana illegally, they should be in prison. Um, but if they're in marijuana for, or if they're in jail for a marijuana um, offense that is now legal, I think everyone should be let out. I mean, I, you know, that's my own personal opinion. Um, but I don't really understand the question about justification to discredit the effects of marijuana on people. I'm not sure I understand um, I, yeah, I, I think a lot of people don't realize that the 502, which was the initiative that legalized recreational marijuana in the state of Washington, was an ACLU um, effort. So, so the ACLU looked at it, and we're a three-strike state, so they looked at it and they said, you know, proportionally, people of color, um, specifically young male individuals of color, are being discriminated for small amounts of marijuana. This is not right. It were a three strike state. They are going to prison for a very long time. Um, Allison Holcomb, who wrote the bill, um, did not expect it to pass. Um, so there's a number of things in the bill. For example, roach clips, the little clips you use to hold a joint, if anybody still uses joints, um, are illegal in the state of Washington. And it just has to do with, they didn't think it was going to be passed. So they put it in there as an illegal, you know, paraphernalia. There's other things that within the bill that, you know, are inverse of that. And so they really thought they were going to drop this bill, get some traction on inequality, um, get traction on the fact that, you know, nonviolent drug offenses should not be enforced at the level that they are. And uh, it passed. <laughs> it's interesting. It's interesting your comment about smoking. Is that sort of passe now to people not smoke it they just do something else with it as you've been implying well i think shannon can discuss the sales but i think it depends on the demographics of individuals i know joints are still very popular but i think vapes are becoming more popular edibles um you know in the demographic that i i am in a lot of my friends have um high school and college kids and so they they prefer not the smell but i think they're still somewhat popular huh, shannon what do you guys they're see from yeah, still popular. You go in and buy a pre-roll, and a lot of times people come in and buy one joint. But um, it's by no means the, um, you know, the the most popular way anymore. There's a lot of different ways to smoke marijuana, and a lot of different contraptions. Many of which I'm still learning. Um, um, an adabrig comes from, you know, the last one I saw was like a chihuly quality glass and it was this massive dragon. And I'm like, how do you even know what to do with that? But I was informed and I actually got a demonstration um, by one of my employees and it was pretty amazing. Okay. All right, so we've got like five minutes left. So I just see if I can just jam some of these questions in. Uh, what kinds of things are you guys doing to engage new cannabis curious customers? That's actually a, a tough question because, you know, we can't do billboards. We can't do, um, you know, email uh, blasts. There's, there's all sorts of things that we're restricted on doing, but this is, this is a help, um, you know, talking to people, trying to remove the mystery. Uh, we do a lot of social media stuff, um, but, uh, you know. We, we do quite a bit, actually. Um, we, we get a lot of kind of curious um, customers because our store is pretty inviting and we have an education station, kind of like a genius bar, which provides, we have educators on every shift, which are individuals really targeted that. So we, we do that on a day-to-day -day basis, but we also have um, um, sessions and forums, education forums. We, prior to COVID, we would bring a lot of the um, retirement communities over and have, um, you know, it, they will come once and then they come like in droves for like the next couple of months afterwards and they start with creams and then they increase, to, there's a lot of help with sleeping, etc. And then we've done a lot, of, we're actually looking at virtual video um, similar in this format so we can do more education on 
you know, the, the key questions we're getting. You know, our goal is to meet people where they're at. Um, there is no requirement to have to feel, it's very intimidating and I'll admit it, the first time I went into a retail shop, um, it was super intimidating and the, the number of um, words and language and the different ways in which you can buy it. I, I mean, it's like, it was way too much. So um, we're really trying to create information that brings people where they're at in the process. And believe me that it's not just kind of curious, it's, it's almost, sort of the progression of products and product lines and learning more about, you know, it's kind of like the wine industry in terms of the different strains and the way they taste and, and the level of connoisseurship around it. Um, it there is even that level that we- You can also call Shannon's store. She has a dial a dial a you know, dial a dial a bun tender. And you, if you don't want to go in and you have questions, call their store and you can have a completely private question about any answer and all the people on our lines are actually at the educator level. So they're all trained and you, it's a pretty, um, you have to be promoted into that role in, in our store. And it requires an, uh, a number of five levels of training. So the code, uh, can I do this? Somalia? But, but, but dial, I, I can't say it. I'm trying to be funny. Dab, dial a bud tender. It's the dab line. The dab line. All right. Well, I think yeah, we're all that. Uh, all right, so how has legalization impacted the use by the underage? It, you know, it, that's a, that depends on what survey you look at. So we do a lot with the addiction group at UW. Um, Bia Carlini's group over there has really, like, led the forefront in this. And um, it depends somewhat on the, the state and the area that you look at. But overall, um, number of studies have shown it's actually gone down. They don't think it's really cool anymore. Um, access, our ability to get it has gone up, but it's also a regulated product now that has, you know, pesticide screening and, and safety standards around it. So, it, you know, in the state of Washington, it appears overall it's, it's gone down, but availability to get it has gone up, which is kind of what you would see. Um, and, you know, quite frankly, it kind of depends on the zip code to some degree. You know, certain high schools will think it becomes cool and, you know, levels will go up in different areas. But overall, the sky hasn't fallen. Let's put it that way. Well, and as a, I don't know all the data points, but I'm, as a pragmatic level, I'm a mom. I have two daughters who are 18 and 21. Five years ago when I came in here, I wouldn't even tell them um, what I was doing. I was working in private equity. Um, and then, you know, I learned over the course of time, I would say my current view is the volume's probably up, but I think it, it's replacing alcohol at some level. And the thing I tell them all, and I would recommend you tell your kids, you know, they're going to get access to it. Don't let them get anything off the illicit market. It is the most dangerous place to get especially manufactured product. All of that crisis in the vape crisis, all of that product was mostly out the back door in California. It was being shipped around the country and the kids that are underage and trying to get access are getting that in their hands. Um, and you just don't want them doing it. All right, I get it. That's an awesome conversation. So uh, Shannon, Jessica, Jackie, and Beth, thank you so much for the conversation today. I'm going to speak on behalf of everyone in our group, including the ones that were not on the show today, uh, that this has been uh, rather eye-opening. 